Well, good evening, and welcome to, to tonight's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know. I think that's copyrighted. Uh, you can find us at commonwealthclub.org or on our Facebook page and on Twitter at CW Club. I'm Jeff Bleich, partner at Munger, Tolls & Olson, former United States Ambassador to Australia and Special Counsel to the President. And I'll be your moderator for today's program with one of the country's premier experts and authorities on negotiation. Our guest tonight is William Urey. He's a mediator, a best-selling author and speaker, working to resolve conflicts ranging from family feuds to boardroom battles to ethnic wars. Dr. Urey is one of the world's leading experts in the art of negotiation. He's co-founder of Harvard's program on negotiation at Harvard Law School as well as being a distinguished senior fellow at Harvard. Bill Urey has taught negotiation and mediation tactics to thousands of corporate, government, military leaders around the world, and he's helped hundreds of business people and organizations reach win-win agreements with their customers, suppliers, unions, and joint venture partners. And today, many of the top business schools and law schools in the country use his books, including books like Getting to Yes, and the power of a positive no. Um, and they use these for teaching negotiating skills, techniques, and strategies. He's also applied his talents to international humanitarian work. Uh, that includes co-founding with President Jimmy Carter, the International Negotiation Network. It's an organization working to end conflicts and civil wars around the world. And in that capacity, he's been engaged in Indonesia with the Bushmen of the Kalahari, with the clan warriors of New Guinea, and even work on the U.S.-Soviet nuclear negotiations. His new best-selling book, Getting to Yes with Yourself, is a prequel to his earlier works. It addresses the psychological issues that we personally bring to the negotiating table that may interfere with our reaching a satisfactory result. William argues that one of the biggest problems for parties to a negotiation and or a, in a mediation is getting, into, is, is getting out of their own way. Uh, and this book, book focuses on the inner obstacles that prevent good outcomes for both sides. His techniques to overcome some common human tendencies can be applied not just in the boardroom but in your daily lives to help you lead more positive, healthy, and productive lives. So listen carefully. William Urey, he's trained as a social anthropologist. He received a BA from Yale, a PhD from Harvard. Welcome to San Francisco, William Urey. It's a huge pleasure to be back here in San Francisco, which uh, I had the pleasure of growing up, spending some years of my childhood here, so it's, uh, it feels like coming home. What I want to talk to you about is negotiation, and I'm just going to speak for a few minutes, and then Jeff and I will have a kind of conversation and take questions from you. But the subject of negotiation reminds me of one of my favorite uh, negotiating stories. It comes from the Middle East, where I'm actually headed in a few weeks. And it's a story of an inheritance dispute where uh, three sons receive from their father 17 camels. And the first son receives half the camels, the second son receives a third of the camels, and the youngest son, being the youngest, receives a ninth of the camels. Well, the three sons start to negotiate. It's not so easy because 17 doesn't divide by two, and it doesn't divide by three, and it doesn't divide by nine. So each one wants more, and they start to get in a little bit of a quarrel. Fraternal relations are disturbed. There's even fear of violence, and finally they in desperation, they consult a wise old woman, and a wise old woman thinks about their problem for a long time. Finally, she comes back and says, well, I don't know if I can help you, but if you want, you can have my camel. So then they have 18 camels. Well, 18 does divide by two, so the first son takes his half, and half of 18 is nine, and 18 does divide by three, so the second son takes his third, and that's six. 18 does divide by 9, and the ninth of 18 is 2. Well, if you add 9 and 6, you get 15, plus 2, 17. They have one camel left over. They give it back to the wise old woman. Now, 
If you think about that story for a moment, I think it resembles a lot of the negotiations that we get involved in. We start off with 17 camels, no way to divide it up. Somehow, we need to learn to take a step back from the situation like that wise old woman, change our assumptions, reframe it, and see if we can come up with an 18th camel. And my, my supposition right now is that that 18th camel may in fact be ourselves. Now, why do I say that? When Roger Fisher and I, uh, 33 years ago, wrote Getting to Yes, we were working on how do you influence the other side? You know, how do you put yourself in the other side's shoes? Because after all, negotiation is an exercise in influence. You're trying to change the other side's mind. If you're trying to change their mind, you need to know where that mind is. And over the subsequent years, as I was involved in a whole variety of disputes and giving talks, one of the most frequent questions I got was, yeah, but how do you get to yes with people who don't want to get to yes? How do you deal with the difficult people on the other side of the table? And so I specialized in that a little bit, like labor strikes, civil wars, boardroom battles. But over the years, it started to dawn on me that perhaps the most difficult person we have to deal with, the biggest obstacle to us getting what we want in negotiation and in life is not the person on the other side of the table, however difficult they might be. It's the person on this side of the table. It's the person we look at in the mirror every morning, namely ourselves right here. It's in our human tendency, very understandable, very natural to react. In other words, to act in ways that don't necessarily serve our interests, our long-term interests. And I've watched that so often. Negotiation is supposed to be goal-oriented behavior. We're supposed to be going after a goal, but we often act in ways that go exactly contrary to our own interests. As the old saying from Ambrose Bierce goes, when angry, you will make the best speech you will ever regret. <laughs> and that is often true, I find. So. Curiously, what I've learned is that, you know, all this time I've been focused just on how you influence the other side, but in fact, it's just as important to focus on how we influence ourselves. That in fact, we often go into a negotiation, and by negotiation, I define it very broadly, incidentally, just as back and forth communication, trying to reach agreement. Something that we engage in every day with our children, our spouses, our parents, our partners, our coworkers, our colleagues in that broad sense of the term, but we negotiate, in, in essence, we've been negotiating often with one arm tied behind our back. In other words, just focusing on the outer when the best instrument we have to influence the other side is here, inside our, of ourselves. So I've gradually come to the conclusion that getting to yes is an inside job. And the foundation of getting to yes with ourselves is, I like to use the metaphor of going to the balcony. It's almost like you're negotiating with the person here on a stage. Part of your mind goes to a mental or emotional balcony overlooking that stage. The balcony is a place of perspective. It's a place of clarity. It's a place of calm. It's a place of self-control. It's a place where you can keep your eyes on the prize. And these days, it's hard to go to the balcony. People often report to me, yeah, but I, I fall off the balcony. And I, I find myself this, in the same situation. You know, you, you're sitting at your desk, for example, and you get an email uh, and you say, wait a minute, they left me out of an important decision. So you're irritated, you're, you're frustrated. So instantly, of course, you compose a reply and you get that, satisfaction of hitting the reply button, except you don't just hit the reply button, you hit the reply all button, and it goes out to the entire organization, you start to see disputes start to escalate. You know, there is a button on that screen which is very rarely used, which I think of as the balcony button. It's, it's the one that says save as draft. <laughs> and, you know, you compose the email, sure, to get it out of your system, you hit save as draft, then everyone has their favorite technique for going to the balcony. It might be to go for a walk, it might be to go have a coffee with a friend, have a night's sleep on it, uh, just, you know, 
whatever, whatever you like to, that gives you that, that sense of perspective, then you're going to come back and you're going to look at that email and you're going to ask yourself the all-important question, does this really serve my interests? Is this really going to advance the resolution of the situation? And you're likely going to hit the delete button and then you're going to pick up the phone, call the person, get together, try to resolve it. That's going to the balcony. If I may just share a, an experience from my own uh, experience. Uh, some years ago, many years ago, I was invited by President Carter to go to the country of Venezuela and, and meet with the president, President Hugo Chavez, and the political opposition at a time when international observers were fearing that the country was almost tipping on the verge of a civil war. There were a million people on the streets of Caracas demanding the resignation of President Chavez. There were a million people on the streets supporting him. People were arming themselves. There was rumors. And, uh, and I spent a number of, a couple of years going back and forth. But in one meeting, I recall, uh, I had a meeting scheduled with President Chavez. It was uh, scheduled at 9 p.m. at the presidential palace. I was there with my colleague Francisco and we uh, were waiting very patiently and 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, midnight finally, we were ushered in to see the president and there was, uh, he wasn't alone, he had his entire cabinet arrayed behind him and he said, oh, Yuri, have, have, a, have a seat here and uh, uh, tell me, what do you, what, what's your impression of how, how things are going here in this country? I said, you know, Mr. President, I've uh, been talking to some of your ministers here and I've been talking to the political opposition and it seems to me there's some progress. Well, that really triggered him. He said, what do you mean progress? Are you crazy? Are you blind? Are you naive? Are you not seeing the dirty tricks those traitors are up to on the other side? And he got furious and he kind of leaned in very close to my face and he proceeded to yell for approximately 30 minutes. And uh, I was there and, it, you know, naturally I was thinking, you know, in my mind, you know, wait a minute, he's wrong, I'm not so naive. Or, and I was also thinking, wow, two years of work here down the drain in this country, you know. But I was able to, you know, go to the balcony for a moment and just say, wait a minute, is it really going to advance my interests and advance the cause of peace if I get into an argument with the president of Venezuela. <laughs> so I bit my tongue and I, I listened uh, to him and just paid very close attention to him from a, kind of from a balcony perspective. And uh, sure enough, after half an hour, I mean, he was, uh, he was famous for giving eight hour speeches and I'm sure if I had gotten into an argument with him, it would have gone in a very unpleasant direction. But after 30 minutes of no reaction from me, I saw his shoulders sink a little bit, a little bit of body language, and then in a somewhat weary tone of voice, he said to me, Yuri, what should I do? Well, that is the sound of a human mind opening. Because before that, when he was in the state of anger, you know, it would have been impossible for me to use reason with him in any case. It would, it's like uh, banging your head against a stone wall. But that's the sound of a human mind opening. So I said, you know, Mr. President, I think uh, the entire country of Venezuela needs to go to the balcony, as it were, because it's, uh, it's December, it's almost Christmas. Last year, Christmas festivities were canceled because of the conflict. Why not just declare a truce and let's let everyone enjoy the holidays with their families. We'll come back in January. Everyone might be in a better mood to listen. He said, that's a great idea. I'm going to propose that in my next speech. His mood had completely shifted. In fact, he said, he said, yeah, over the Christmas holidays, I'm going to travel around Venezuela and I'd like you to come with me actually and see the country. And uh, then he thought for a moment, but you're a mediator, you're supposed to be neutral, you shouldn't be in my company all the time. But he said, that's no problem, I'll give you a disguise. <laughs> and uh, what, what happened there was, you know, because I had been able to 
you know, those three hours I was waiting, I spent some time just in silence, you know, listening to myself, as it were, just, you know, preparing myself mentally and emotionally for what was going to come. So when he surprised me with, with, uh, with his um, anger and his temper, you know, I could, for a moment, I could just, I could watch from the balcony. I could watch my own, you know, feelings of anxiety or fear around, oh, or, or disappointment or, or embarrassment. And I could just let those things go so that I could then really listen to him because I had listened to myself. I was able to listen to him. And this is what I find generally in this, in this world is that, you know, the key in negotiation is to be able to listen to the other side, to put yourself in their shoes. But it's very hard for us to do that when we're in conflict because our minds are so full of thoughts and emotions and reactions and so if that's the problem is us, that's also where the solution is. That's the 18th camel. We can take a moment to listen to ourselves. I mean, what if before a difficult phone call, a difficult meeting, we took a single moment just to quiet our minds and focus our intention just a single minute or two? I believe we would be better able to listen to others. So that's what my new work is about is I realize that, that there's a missing first half to getting to yes, which is the art of getting to yes with ourselves first so that we can then get to yes with others. And uh, so I, I think I will pause right there and really open it up to, to questions. But I would say this maybe, that there are very few things in life under our control, but one thing that we can do is we can learn to influence ourselves. We're like a musical instrument. If we can tune our own instrument, we're going to be much better off both at providing satisfaction to ourselves, but also at getting along with others around us. Thank you. Well, Bill, um one way to describe your earlier work, getting to yes and now getting to yes with yourself, is the first teaches you how to get, you know, put yourself in someone else's shoes. This one helps you put yourself in your own shoes. Right. Uh, but we've all got our own kinds of shoes. Some people have angry shoes and some people have flashy shoes and introverted, extroverted. Um, how, do you, how, how do you help people um, sort through the differences? Because that will affect their negotiating style uh, tremendously and it will also affect... Um, you know, uh, the, the kind of guidance you would give them. Yeah, let me, um, I, it's true. The, the antecedent, there's, it's almost like what I've learned is there's a psychological antecedent for all the negotiating principles of getting to yes, where you apply it to yourself first. So the psychological antecedent to putting yourself in the other side's shoes is putting yourself, as you say, in your own shoes. And people say, well, well how am I not already in my own shoes? But how many of us can honestly say that we truly listen to ourselves with the kind of empathy that a good friend might? Because often what I find is what's going on inside of ourselves is a lot of negative, let's call it self-talk. I mean, psychologists estimate that we may have as many as 60,000 thoughts a day. 80% of them, they estimate, are negative. And you know, there's always, you know, is this going to work? I'm going to be a failure. I did that wrong. You know, there's that voice, that inner critic in all of us. And there's an old saying that uh, if we talk to our friends the way we talk to ourselves, we wouldn't have any. Uh, and so to yeah. me, the challenge is to be able to listen to ourselves that, I mean, for example, with, with President Chavez, that's what I was able to do. I was able to listen to myself, not suppress my thoughts or feelings, but just listen, just observe them first from a balcony perspective, listen to them, and let them go. And that's what created the space for me to be able to listen to him. And what I also find is that it's, um, you know, negotiation. Negotiation is about getting what you want, but oftentimes I find when I work with people and and... We don't know what we really want, yeah. you know, and we're torn. And uh, I could give examples about that, but I, w I want to <laughs> invite your questions then. No, no, I mean, I, 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 my sense from your book is that part of the reason why people 
express themselves different ways is that they're dealing with something. People may be very extroverted because they're trying to compensate for something. Um, or they may be introverted because of some other issue, and they may get angry uh, because they're frustrated and they don't know the source of their frustration. And so part of what you're talking about is stepping back, observing yourself, saying, I am angry. Why, why, why is that going on? Right. Um, and one kind of interesting c question I like to use is, isn't that curious? You yeah. know, if you kind of say, I'm kind of angry right now. Isn't that curious? It immediately puts you on the balcony. It's almost like you're invoking what I think of as your inner scientist. You know, you're, you're observing yourself. Uh, you know, I was trained as an anthropologist and the, uh, the method of anthropology, as you know, is, uh, is participant observation. Yeah. You, know, you know, when you f visit a foreign culture, you don't just observe the culture, you participate in it. You know, there are rituals and there are lives. And I find that, you know, we could take the same approach towards our own lives as we participate in our own lives, but we can also be observing that and that allows us to choose whether or not to react. There's kind of a crossroads to react or to act in a proactive way that actually advances our interests. Well, uh, what do you do, though, when you're, um, you, you found your center and you're balanced and you're observing yourself, but the person on the other side uh, uh, has either, ha has just shut down. Right. You know, they just don't, they don't want to engage. They have their point of view, and if they can't have it, they, they don't want to listen. What, what is the technique other than um, just shaming them into it by being so cool and calm and nice yourself? <laughs> no, I, I think you know, the, the key is, well, first, you've got to, you know, we tend to react to that. We get frustrated, for example, and that frustration can lead us into, you know, getting kind of almost sucked in, you know, an eye for an eye and we all go blind, you know, you, you can get reactive. So that's the first thing is to go to the balcony. But then, then, you, then you've got a challenge, which is they're not, they're not responding. They've got a rigid position, uh, w whatever there is. And I think the key to me is to, is to try and find out why. Why are they feeling that way? Are they feeling uh, fearful? Are they feeling angry? Are they, um, is, is it really that they, that, you know, that they're, are they just trying to win? You know, just tr see if you can find out draw them out and um, by asking questions for one, just to listen to them. Uh, most people, most of us don't feel that people listen to us and including the very people who are very difficult. But if you can listen to them, I find you, they will give you clues as to what's going on for them. And once you know what's going on for them, then you have a better chance to, to address it. But the other thing is in negotiation, you know, from a balcony perspective, you have to know what your interests are, but then you have to know what, uh, in negotiation, a term that Roger Fisher and I coined many years ago called your BATNA, which is an acronym standing for your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. It's like uh, if you're not going to do business with one customer, you, have a, you might have another customer. If you're not going to get one job, you have another job. What's your alternative? What's your best course of action for satisfying your interests if for some reason you're not able to reach agreement? In the situation you're talking about, it's very good to really think through, well, if I don't reach agreement with that person, how am I going to satisfy my interests? That will give you more confidence and more of a sense of power if you, th if you have an alternative. Yeah. And actually, oddly enough, paradoxically, if you have that confidence, with them and you're not so dependent on them, you care about the situation, but you don't care so much, you're not their prisoner, I find that you negotiate more effectively and you're more likely to reach an agreement in the end. Yeah. I thought one of the more interesting anecdotes in your book was with a uh, business person, a long-term dispute uh, about control over a company and money and everything else, and um, you asked him what he wanted and he said, well, I want control of the company and I want my money. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then you ask the next question, which is, well, why do you want that? And he said eventually that he just wanted more freedom. Um, and he said, well, there are lots of ways to get freedom, and they, those aren't the only two paths to it. And uh, it seemed to me one of the ways you get the other side to figure out what they want is to start asking them that second, third, fourth, fifth level of question. That's it. And that's, I mean, the, there's this kind of magical question, you know, why type questions. Help me understand what your needs are. Why do you want that? Like, in, in, as you mentioned, 
that was a situation. I learned a lot from that, and that was a situation where I was, uh, I got an email from uh, a person I knew who was a business leader. She was a well-known business leader in Brazil. She said, can you help my father? He's just, uh, he was the founder of, you know, Brazil's largest retailer, you know, company, large company, 150,000 people. And for two and a half years, it was just a legal battle with lawsuits, arbitrations all over the papers. The media called it, you know, the biggest cross-continental boardroom showdown in recent history. But when I, so when I sat down, and it was affecting not just him and the other, and the other party, but their families, you know, the employees, even, you know, commercial relations between Brazil and France, the two countries. So when I sat down with him, uh, as I listened to him, first of all, it wasn't clear to me that what he, what he really wanted. Uh, did he want to fight? You know, he was 76 at the time. He was going to be chairman of the board for another eight years. Is that really what he wanted to do with his life? And, and just as you were saying, Jeff, uh, when I asked him, what do you, you know, tell me what you need, you know, it's like, he's like us. Oftentimes we don't know what we want, and, but he said, okay, I, he knew he could give me what he needed in, this, in the form of positions. Yes, he wanted uh, the stock at a certain price. He wanted the elimination of a three-year non-compete clause. He wanted real estate. He gave me a list. But I said, what do you really want? You know, just to probe, just like you're saying, to probe. And after a while, he struggled with that. But finally, he said, freedom. That's what I want, freedom. And then I was able to ask him, so what? Because that's when I was listening to the human being, not just the champion business person. And I said, well, what do you want the freedom for? He said, well, I want the freedom to be with my family, which is the most important thing in my life, and also to pursue new business deals. But then there was this other question I asked him, which was, tell me something. Who can really give you what you most want? Who can give you the freedom you most want? Is it just your arch enemy, your former business partner? Or at least to some extent, is it you? You can, you can actually satisfy your own interests independently. It's like you're, you're Batna. And... Uh, and he said, yeah, okay. So then he became chairman of the board of another company. He, he, um, he spent time with his family, went on a long vacation. He, you know, he pursued other business deals. Psychologically, I, f I feel that made a big difference because then he wasn't so psychologically, emotionally dependent on the, on the resolution of this. He could relax a little bit so that when it actually came to sitting down, me sitting down with my colleague with the representative of the other side in Paris at a lovely restaurant there in Paris, he said, he asked me why I'm here. And I said, because life is too short. That's why. Yeah. It's too short for these kinds of battles in which each side tries to win, but in the end, everyone ends up losing. And so what I, what I said was, well, if we could just agree on these two principles, freedom for both parties to get on with their lives and dignity, and I think we can maybe resolve it. So he said, well, come back, come to my office tomorrow. It was, the first meeting was on a Monday, on Tuesday. By Friday, we had both parties, both men sitting in a law office, signing an agreement, joint press statement, wishing each other well, uh, going and talking to the executives and the employees of the company. And, and the thing was over. And my client was extremely happy. He said, I got everything I wanted, but most important, I got my life back. And the other side was happy too. That was the paradoxical thing. They'd been in this great battle, but by getting to the essence, by him being able to get to yes with himself, which is the key thing for all of us, he was able to get to yes with the other side. Um, have you ever given any talks for members of the U.S. Congress? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a good question. You know, you know, one of the things I've noticed is, you know, there's, uh, in one sense, you know, negotiation, is, as, as you were mentioning before, Jeff, you know, is being widely taught now and, you know, getting to yes in law schools and business schools, schools of government and so on, corporations. But there's still a lot of people out there who are busily getting to know. And uh, Congress is one classic example. Uh, and... 
it's exceedingly, uh, and it's one of those classic examples of each side's trying to win and make the other side lose, but in the end, not only do both sides lose, but there's always a third loser, which is the big loser, which is us, the American people, because of the stalemate. And so I have uh, occasionally had uh, encounters with Democrats and Republicans seeing if you know there was some possibility there. I recall one occasion some years ago where I was invited to facilitate at a, um, to be one of the facilitators at a bipartisan congressional retreat where we had a couple hundred members of Congress, Democrats and Republicans with their families uh, in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And, uh, and I was really struck there First of all, just by how little communication there is normally across the aisle. I was just shocked because a number of them said to me, you know, we just spoke to a member of the opposite party more in this three-hour train ride from D.C. up to Hershey, Pennsylvania than we did in the previous four years. And uh, that's, that's a real problem. Uh, there's, there's some structural problems, which is it used to be that members of Congress you know, used to live in Washington and, you know, they used to have kids in the same schools, little league, whatever it was. But now, you know, they mostly fly home on the weekends and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a real problem. And to me, they do need uh, very badly to, uh, to, to, to get to yes. It's, it's one of the great challenges facing us. And part of it, just to take responsibility here ourselves, is they pay a lot of attention to us, the American people. And if we started evaluating and choosing our, and voting, depending on who we think is actually working to get to yes for the sake of the whole, for the sake of the country, if we started to evaluate our leaders on the basis of how well they listen rather than just talk, I think uh, there would be some responsiveness. So there's, there's a... There's a lot to happen in the country to, sh to, to shift that. Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and, and when you have elections where 32% of Americans vote, um, what it means is that you've got the extremes on both sides, and it's hard to find that middle ground. If you had 100% voting, you'd probably have a lot of um, middle ground there that both sides would have to, ha have to speak to if they wanted to keep their, keep their day jobs. Right. So, yeah. Um, this is the Commonwealth Club of California. And we are talking to William Urey, author of How to Get to Yes with Yourself and Other Worthy Opponents. I'm Jeff Bleich, partner at Munger, Tolls & Olson here in San Francisco, former United States Ambassador to Australia and Special Counsel to the President and your Commonwealth Club moderator. You can hear Commonwealth Club programs on the radio and also see video of the programs online on your YouTube channel. Uh, we're continuing now with some audience questions. Um, a, a question about gender. Uh, there have been studies that say that women often don't negotiate well for themselves, that they will negotiate well for others, uh, but that uh, culturally they've been trained not to advocate as effectively for themselves. Do you have thoughts or tips? Well, yeah, I think um, there's some truth to that, and I think that's, that's something where um, women, I think, and there have been some studies that women pay more attention to relationships sometimes than men, and so... Uh, because they're concerned about the relationship, they may not be asserting their own interests as strongly as they might. And so I think, again, this is where I found, um, you know, when I started in this field of negotiation, people said, well, either you're a born nego negotiator or you're not, and that's it. And over, you know, we started, there weren't any courses on negotiation when I started. And, and so... Now there are courses, and what we've learned is you can learn to be better. So I think th this is a real opportunity for women in particular to, you know, actually you can train yourself to be a better negotiator. You can train yourself to advocate. You can train yourself to be more assertive. And it doesn't mean being antagonistic. There are ways in which you can be soft on the people, soft on the relationship, while being very hard on the problem. And, uh, and I also find that in some situations, it may be useful to, when, when, when it is a very sensitive situation where you find it hard to fully advocate for yourself, that's where it may be useful actually to have someone with you who can 
you know, an agent or a lawyer or someone who can, or a negotiator, someone who can, who can help represent you. And bec but from a balcony perspective, you can recognize that. And that's not just women. I mean, that's, I mean, for example, I've had the privilege of training um, hostage, some hostage negotiators, people who, you know, policemen who, who, um, who work in the large, in the large metropolitan cities. I mean, it used to be that they, um, you know, 30 or 40, 30 years ago or so, that, you know, the main way they used to deal with it was very much like, you know, in a Wild West movie, you know, go, you know, there'd be a hostage situation, bank criminal or whatever, bank robber, whatever, or emotionally distraught person, and they would pull out a bullhorn and say, you've got three minutes to come out with your hands up, and then three minutes would pass and out would come the guns and, you know, one or more person might be dead. But then they learned there's a better way to do it, which is they go in now and they get on the phone. They have police hostage, you know, trained police hostage negotiators. And, you know, they show a little bit of respect. They listen to the other side. They try to put themselves in their shoes. But they're, they're soft in dealing with the people, but they remain very hard that, you know, okay, there needs to be a surrender of the hostages and a, a surrender of the hostage taker. And in and, and like... 99% of the cases, it may take 10 hours or 12 hours or 14 hours. Sometimes they don't even make the papers anymore. It's like the hostage taker surrenders. What's the key to doing that is one thing they learned is you don't just send in one hostage negotiator because one hostage negotiator is going to be, you know, they're going to, it's very easy to get identified with a suffering, you know, with the, with the possibility of losing someone. They have like team of like 10 people. So there's one person talking, there's nine people on the balcony who are listening, who are thinking, what's the next step? What are we going to do? Try and track down that person's mother or father to talk to them. They're, they're always thinking. And so I think in negotiation is a complicated situation. So sometimes you don't just want to go in by yourself. You want to go in with, with a team or with, with some help. So all those movie scenes that we see with just the one negotiator, you know, yes. or it's just Bruce Willis. Right. We're, we're, <laughs> it's not really true. Um, you know, what I found is that um, whether you're negotiating with a country or whether you're negotiating with business people or whether you're negotiating with your kids, uh, people tend to put themselves in one of two positions, either as a, a hero or a victim. Um, no one's ever the villain. They're never wrong. They're just, you know, I'm an... I'm, I'm doing the heroic thing. You just don't understand it. Or, you know, you're taking advantage of me. I'm a victim. Um, and it's hard for people to honestly see that they're neither, that they're a little bit of both. Um, uh, one of the audience members says, you know, that's probably the hardest thing for people to be honest with themselves. How do you, how do you tease honesty out of people during the negotiation? Yeah, you know, it's interesting that, Jeff, the... the um the what I see often the core pattern in conflict is favorite game is the blame game. You know, it's kind of like you're you're to blame for the conflict. You're to blame for what's wrong in the relationship. I remember when I worked with uh, uh, on, with U.S. and Soviet policymakers and negotiators, trying to figure out ways we'd. We organized meetings back in the time of the Cold War to think about ways to reduce the risk of nuclear war. And at a time of real tension uh, back in, in the early 80s and mid 80s, and the, you know, we'd have these sessions that, and the first couple of days, it was just mutual recriminations, you know, y your country did this, you're, you're to blame for this, whatever. So like after, I remember the third meeting I proposed, because I was a facilitator of these meetings, was we had an agenda and the first item on the agenda was before breakfast on the first day and I labeled the session. The subject of the session was mutual accusations. <laughs> Everyone was welcome to come before breakfast, make all their accusations so that we could then move on and, and people got it. And so to me, that's one of the great challenges is how do we get beyond the blame game and part of it comes, starts with us because the truth is, in any relationship, maybe the other side is 99%. That's their thing. But there's that 1% that's ours. If we can begin by taking responsibility for the whole, because, you know, you know, it takes two to tango, but it only takes one to begin to shift that relationship. And interestingly, when we paint ourselves as the victim, either individually or collectively, subtly what we're doing is we're 
we're surrendering our own power because we're saying, you're the perpetrator, there's nothing I can do. But in fact, by taking responsibility, it doesn't mean taking blame. It's not about blaming yourself, but responsibility, in other words, the ability to respond constructively to the situation, we take back our own power to change it for the better. Uh, one, of our, uh, one of our audience members has written a, a, a very thoughtful note saying that they had been uh, terminated by the CEO and was so angry and so emotional that they just couldn't stand a face-to-face -face confrontation with the CEO because they, they knew their emotions would get the better of them. And so they decided to do all correspondence in writing. Mm. Um, and uh, they, they wondered if at the end of the day, I think they weren't perfectly satisfied with the resolution, whether they thought it was a hindrance. Um, and, uh, and, if, and if doing it in writing won't work, you know, what else could this person do? So let me just make sure I understand the, the it, it was, it was satisfactory or unsatisfactory? I think it was unsatisfactory. Unsatisfactory, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. Dignity and, and, honesty and honesty and fairness and honoring agreements were what I wanted. And um, so, yeah, uh, the thing is, writing sometimes gives you a chance to go to the balcony and really think very carefully about what you're going to say. Um, but it may not give the, the, the satisfaction of face-to-face -face being able to tell the person how you feel. Obviously, the person felt betrayed and, and that agreements were violated. And I think there is the possibility. And what, what, the, what the questioner was concerned about was you know, their own emotions. So that, that's a classic case where it might be useful to actually have a meeting with someone, a friend, or someone who can be there, who can kind of keep, you know, sometimes also having a third party there kind of keeps the situation under some kind of, there's a container control, but carefully orchestrated so that the person can express their feelings and how they felt directly to the person, uh, to the boss in this particular case. And you can, you may not get, there's a difference between, you know, Sub substantive justice and procedural justice, you may not get the exact outcome you want, but at least you get, you know, you feel like you get a hearing or that you, you, got, you, got, you got heard, you got a chance to express your, your feelings. You know, for example, on a larger scale right now, there's a whole experimentation taking place collectively of how you deal with the aftermath of wars. And starting in places like South Africa, they, with uh, like Bishop Tutu, they started creating these truth and reconciliation commissions because even though they didn't, you know, there was an amnesty basically, uh, a forgiveness, uh, people, the, the people, victims of the conflict needed to be able to tell their story and be heard. And they needed even other people to, you know, they needed the truth. And that was a powerful psychological need and so that is, whether it's a microcosm or a macrocosm, we need to find, to experiment with new ways that allow people to express their emotions, but in a, in a setting where, where it doesn't go out of control. Yeah. There are a lot of questions um, from the audience tonight uh, about different adversaries of President Obama. <laughs> Uh -huh. How should President Obama deal with the Republicans? How should he deal with Iran? How should he deal with ISIS? Um, okay. you've, you've had some time to observe the president, uh, his negotiating style over six years. Do you have any thoughts on it or and any suggestions about um, uh, uh, techniques or other things he might, might employ? Well, let's see. Where, where do you want to start? <laughs> uh, the... the uh, and you probably actually, you worked with him closely, right? For, uh, so you, you, you probably actually could answer this even better than I could. But They're curious about your views. Yeah, my views. <laughs> but I, I honestly believe the president wants to negotiate, wants to get to yes. Uh, I think that's his, his, his general philosophy. I mean, for example, with Iran as an example, you know, he started off you know, by trying to have an opening with Iran, even from the very beginning of his administration. And, uh, and I think he, he tried to reach out in his own way to the Republicans. Um, I think where is a question, 
what could he do now or what could he have done better or what was what are the questions here? Okay. Yeah, I think, so let I me let me go with it for a moment. Maybe, but maybe you could yeah, do both. No, I, I I think there are opportunities. I mean, he's had a he got dealt a very tough hand. Um, came in, there was a major economic crisis, financial crisis, uh, was, and he um, and there was I think a lot of the country had difficulty even accepting him as president, uh, and so. There, but there was, there was. I, th my personally, what if if I had been in his shoes, or what I would think, is, if you're dealing with Congress, for example, it's it's almost like you have to be an anthropologist. You have to understand Congress works with a lot of pressing the flesh. It's you got to spend a lot of time with people, and I don't think that was his natural inclination. You know to. Uh, to do that, you know, a classic example, sort of very different, was LBJ. You know, just spent all his time trying to do that. And I think, uh, or, or Bill Clinton was an, was another example. And uh, so I think that's where, that's where, uh, if anything, it's just there's so much, so much of it is relationship and building relationship. And so I think that that's key in terms of dealing with. I mean, there are whole range of things where I, I think, for example, with Iran, uh, just as one example, because I, I, I think he's, he's trying to do his best there, and I think it's really important. I mean, to me, that's a, a critical negotiation, because I've, I've actually looked at the, um, the war game scenarios of what war with Iran would be. That would be the alternative to a negotiation, and they are not pretty. I mean, basically... Uh, uh, if the United States were to go to war with Iran over its nuclear weapons, I mean, horrendous humanitarian c consequences. It's not something like a targeted strike where you could, you know, something like that. It might even require, you know, lead to boots on the ground. I mean, it would, it, it's, it's almost unfathomable, but I've seen the, the scenarios and the, it's, it would quickly escalate uh, in a very dangerous and difficult way. So, so negotiation makes huge sense. Uh, it's also, I mean, just even looking at the national interests of Iran and the United States, of uh, it, you know, being able to collaborate against ISIS, for example, uh, being able to uh, work to try to bring an end to the war, terrible war in Syria. So to me, I, I credit the president for, for really having the courage to take up that negotiation. But every negotiation, of course, is these three tables. It's not just the negotiation with the Iranians. There's a negotiation inside the United States with the Republicans in order to make that work. And there's a negotiation inside Iran between the hardliners and the moderates. And all of that has to be aligned. And it's right now, it's very much on the tipping point of whether it's going to work or not. But I, I, uh, I think he's doing the right thing. Well, some, sometimes you have to create the environment um, where an agreement can finally be found depending on who you're up against. I, I used to get faulted for uh, not seeming mean enough to be a lawyer. You know? mm -hmm. and, uh, but what I found was I would normally go to the other side at the beginning and say, look, we both see where this case is going. It's going to settle over money. Um, we're going to fight for three years, um, ruin a lot of people's lives, spend a fortune. And at the end, it's going to end up somewhere in this range. So we could do this the easy way or the hard way. And 90% of the time, the other side said, you're crazy, we're going to destroy you. And you had to beat them up for about a year and a half, and then they started to have a, an honest conversation. Is that, it, it, you know, it, is, that, is that a reasonable technique? Which is sometimes you say, it's yeah. just not, it's not time to negotiate yet. Um, you can't really appreciate the consequences of your action until you've experienced a few of them. Well, it's, there's, I mean, oftentimes when people are offered a choice between learning the easy way and learning the hard way, we take the hard way. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but the question is, I think the negotiating challenge for us is how can we, how can we accelerate the necessary education? And we often confuse um, you know, using force and coercion as the only way that we can do that. But in fact, uh, there, are other, there are other methods, but it's just it's to think about it as, how do I make it as easy 
as possible. I like to think about it this way. How do I make it as easy as possible for the other side to make the decision I'd like them to make? It's not just about how do I make it as hard as possible for them, but how do I make it as easy as possible? And there you want to think about uh, not just you know, that there's gonna, they're going to have to appreciate the consequences, you know, the hard, slow slog, but can we uh, sit down and put on the table something that's attractive enough for them to start moving in that direction? How do we speed up that education process? And I've, I've found maybe, you know, it doesn't work in every single case, but I found in the majority of cases there are ways to, to speed that up so you don't have to take, you know, you know, three years or whatever, but you, I mean, and, a, and a good example, you know, was the, was the, was that negotiation I, I told you about in, in Brazil just now where it was widely expected that that was going to go on for another eight years. And by really trying to understand the interests of each side uh, and meeting them in a not, you know, I, when I met with them, I didn't say, this is what we're going to do to you if you don't, you know, there weren't, weren't, there weren't any threats. Uh, that somehow opened up the possibility of a much speedier, very quick, mutually satisfactory resolution that no one expected. Yeah. Um, one of the questions is what you do in situations where you don't know the person you're dealing with and it's, um, you know, spot reactions. And in particular, he, he said, what advice would you give to young black men to negotiate when they're stopped by the police? Wow, okay. These are easy questions. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's a tough yeah. crowd here yeah. in the Commonwealth Club. <laughs> no, 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 but, but what this shows you is just, just how, you know, how pervasive this challenge is. It's, to me, this is perhaps the most important, certainly one of the most important competences that any human being, we need to learn, all of us need to learn it, and not just, when I teach people, you know, I often, I usually teach adults, but to me, I feel like I'm engaging in remedial education because these are skills of social and emotional intelligence that, you know, that are as important as any arithmetic and English and so on. Because, and in fact, there are studies showing that kids who learn these skills early on, that these skills actually have more to do with their success later in life than a lot of the, most of the academic subjects that you study. So in that particular question, yeah, I would say... Uh, again, I would come back to this concept of the, of the balcony because it's like uh, there's so much reactivity in that moment. Uh, someone's got a gun, someone doesn't have a gun, do they have a gun? In split-second reactions, people are making decisions that have huge tragic consequences. And so the ability to, um, to go to the balcony uh, in that moment, to be able to like, suspend your normal reaction and ask what is really important to me right now and here, uh, that kind of training, I would say, is, is important for everyone, not just young black men who are, who are you know, in those very, very treacherous situations, but I think our whole society needs to learn these skills. I mean, if you think about it for a moment, you know, just um, even so something like, you know, like terrorism, for example. How does terrorism work? Terrorists can do a certain amount of damage, but their main instrument is they work through fear. They create fear. And so we become our own worst enemies by our own reaction to that fear. You know, after 9-11, you know, how did we end up going to war in Iraq? It was because of fear. Uh, we reacted to fear. Uh, and we did ourselves, you know, you know, we're paying huge consequences for a fear-based reaction. So I think somehow this ability to stop for a second, suspend our reaction, ask ourselves what's truly important here is important in the microcosm, but it's also important, you know, as a society. You know, there, there are negotiations that get right to the, to the point of, 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 of reaching agreement, and then one party suddenly realizes that this is the only thing they've cared about for the past 10 years. And they, they just, you know, have had nothing else as, as present in their mind as this one conflict. And if it's resolved, um, they're anticipating a great emptiness. And so in those final moments, they try to blow the thing up. Um, and it happens over and over again. 
Um, how, do you, how do you prevent that from happening? Well, that's, that's exactly it. Is we, are all, we are our own worst enemies sometimes in, in those situations. You're right. I mean, there, there are, we get, um, sometimes in those conflicts, we get, it's almost like we get, that conflict is what gives us meaning. It's, it, we're almost, uh, and so we're afraid. And I, I had this same experience with this uh, Brazilian business person in those last, you know, few hours, last day, you know, he vacillated back and forth. And thankfully, I was there to remind him. I said, wait a minute, do you remember our conversation in the beginning? What did you tell me you most wanted? What was the most important thing to you? Was freedom. What, you know, you wanted to be with your family. So I was able to remind him of what his best self had said to me, you know, a few months earlier. And I think in those cases, to have a friend, to have a close family member, to have people around who can, who can be there to remind you of what you really want is, is, is extremely helpful. Yeah. You, you he had his wife who, to yeah. remind him. He had his daughter. And so he listened because it was extremely hard because he was basically saying goodbye to something, you know, a company that he'd founded, spent 50 years with. One of, our, one of our audience members asks whether you've ever been able to get rid of the table. The table suggests that you've got people on opposite sides with opposing views trying to work it out. How, um, is there a way to get uh, to no table where it's just all of us in a room versus the problem? Yeah, I, that, that is actually, it's, uh, I find that a very useful method in many cases because the, the, the physical setting of the room often carries assumptions. And so if you're sitting on one side of the table, the other side is sitting on the other side of the table. It's almost like, you know, you're, it's a Super Bowl, you know. It's a, and, and somehow if you can both sit on the same side of the table facing the problem on the other, you yeah. know, maybe you put it up on a flip chart or something like that, the, the focus is on us jointly tackling the problem rather than attacking each other. And so I find that that works. And, and better yet is maybe is to lose the table altogether. Uh, I find people open up more. You know, going back to that meeting with Democrats and Republicans, we, we broke up into small groups and we had no table. We just had chairs in a circle. And, uh, and as a result, the conversation got deeper, more informal, more truthful, more constructive. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. Our thanks to William Urey, author of How to Get to Yes with Yourself. We also want to thank our audiences here in San Francisco and on the radio, television, Internet. I'm Jeff Bleich, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. <laughs>